Good afternoon and welcome to Supply Chain Now Radio. We are broadcasting live today from the supply chain capital of the country, uh, country Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Scott Luton. I'm your host for today's session. In today's live webinar, it's all about leadership and leadership best practices. Our guest speaker today is Chuck Baker, a West Point graduate, former U.S. Army officer, and a 32-year supply chain veteran. But more about Chuck in just a moment. As always, we're glad to have you with us here today on Supply Chain Now Radio. So let's first tackle our ground rules. Uh, all attendees will be on mute as we're looking to optimize the audio experience. Now with that said, let's make it as interactive as possible. Please do submit your questions via the chat toolbar and we'll answer as many as we have time for at the conclusion of today's webinar. Finally, a PDF of today's presentation and the recording will be available in the next few days to each of our attendees. All right, let's take a minute to recognize our sponsors here on Supply Chain Now Radio. Apex Atlanta offers leading supply chain certification, best practices, and networking. TalentStream is helping companies win the war for talent. The Effective Syndicate works with organizations to develop bulletproof processes and teams that are built to win. And Verison is attacking overstock and waste in inventory with AI-backed decision-making. Thanks to each of these organizations that allow us to share content and best practices within the end-to-end -end supply chain industry. Okay, so let's introduce our speaker today. To our audience, you are in for a treat. Uh, we are I have the good fortune of featuring Chuck Baker on today's webinar. I've known Chuck for a number of years within the APIX and now the ASCM community. And I've always admired his, his successful leadership approach. So now you can benefit from what I've benefited from for years. So about Chuck. So Chuck graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and served six years in the Army. He's worked with Michelin for over 32 years, where he is currently responsible for continuous improvement processes for 21 distribution sites uh, for the company in North America. Chuck is married to his wife, Debbie, for 36 years, who is also an Army veteran. He has three grown children and a two-year-old grandson and a six-month-old granddaughter. He is also author of the really neat book called Three Days Till Monday, which is available on Amazon.com, amongst other places. On a personal note, Chuck has a commercial pilot's license. He has been in theater performances in Greenville, South Carolina, and the surrounding areas, and he sings in the choir at church. Chuck is involved, as I mentioned, with ASCM, the Association for Supply Chain Management, which is an international supply chain membership organization. He also uh, holds leadership positions with Toastmasters International. Um, with regard to his inv involvement with ASCM, which, was, which uh, APEX is part of, he served as president of the local chapter, which is called the APEX Industrial Crescent Chapter, on two occasions. Chuck is also, as if he does not have enough on his plate, <laughs> Chuck, all, uh, Chuck has also been the race director for the Michelin 5K for the past 10 years. So you're all, to our audience, you're, you're really in for a treat. Uh, he's one of the good people out there making things happen. With all that said, please join me in welcoming Mr. Chuck Baker. Thank you, Scott. I do appreciate that. Yes, there's a lot of things I've done in my life, and I keep on thinking, well, gosh, Thomas Jefferson did a lot in his life, and I haven't met <laughs> anywhere near what he's been doing before. I start off this slide of the uh, presentation with a slide picture, and it looks like a photo maybe from the 1950s and 1940s, black and white. This is what West Point looks like with the George Washington statue in the front right behind the George Washington statue is the entrance to the mess hall and on the left side and right side are the barracks and up on top of the hill you see the cadet chapel and you think gosh you know this is old time West Point but if you look at what West Point really looks like now this is what it is we're looking north on Hudson River obviously you have all the barracks you can see there some of the academic buildings, the baseball field, and the plane. And the plane is where we do our marching when we have our parades. If you look at it, as you're looking north, there's a protrusion to the right side, which is actually called a West Point, which is where the United States, back in Revolutionary War, wanted to block the British from going up the Hudson River and dividing the country into two areas. What we did was we put a chain across there so that the British would not be able to sail up there and divide the country. And that's where West Point started 
uh, their, its name. It's a great place to ever visit, one of the best places to see a football game, as well as any time in the fall time. It's beautiful to be up there during this time. Let's get started with this. Obviously, we talk about 20th century leaders and 21st century leadership. Let's look at the leaders we've had at West Point. Douglas MacArthur, class of 1903, fought in the First World War as well as the Second World War. Then you have Dwight Eisenhower, class of 1915. Benjamin O. Davis, Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen. If you have never heard about Benjamin O. Davis, I suggest go ahead and reading about him. Also, as I talk about this, start taking notes. There may be certain areas I talk about, and I really recommend that you, you write down some of the books I'll be talking about. But Benjamin O. Davis ran the Red Tails, and he was responsible for putting that organization together during the Second World War. Wonderful, great, uh, uh, great leader. Then you've got on the bottom left, Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, class of 69, and Nadja West, who's class of 82, and Ann McLean, who's the first person we'll talk about for the 21st century, just came back four weeks ago from the International Space Station and was up there for uh, over 200 days. As you see on the left-hand side, all the different people and different things that have come out of West Point, one of the things that stands out is 21 astronauts. And you think, wait a minute, don't the astronauts either come from the Naval Academy or, or Air Force Academy? But if you think about it, a lot of the individuals go to astronautics and take on a second, uh, organ a f a second course and be able to go into masters or uh, PhDs, and that's where a lot of them are coming out of. And McLean is only one. Buzz Aldrin, class of 51, is also a West Point graduate who went into the United States Air Force. Think about the Air Force only started in 1947, and we didn't have an Air Force Academy until 1959. So a lot of the pilots that came out of the 50s were Air Force graduates. And then you have the other person we're talking about, the leader here. Veterans Day at Michelin 2017 had an opportunity to be able to speak to the organization there. Top right, yes, I'm a singer at the Greenville Drive games. Greenville Drive is a 1A team for the Boston Red Sox. And since 2013, I've had an opportunity to be able to sing the national anthem at their stadium. And it's a blast to be able to be there in front of individuals singing the national anthem. And the bottom right, yeah, I'm a race director for the Michelin 5K, but also as a race director for the run for hay. We collected hay for horses that were abandoned or looking to be able to be adopted. And it's a great, op great opportunity to be able to raise money for something like that. The other part, three days till Monday, the book that Scott talked about slightly, uh, quickly. And that was written a few years ago. And I'll talk about that later on when we talk about the little symbol on my chest there. It says Pennsylvania Free Enterprise Week, PFEW. But let's get into this thing we call leadership. And I want to first off talk about the different individuals that have certain sayings, certain quotes. Rosalind Carter starts it off by saying, a leader takes people where they want to go, but a great leader takes them where they don't necessarily, necessarily want to go but ought to be. And I, I think about this many times by saying, yes, if you think about the individuals that were leaders, people don't really want to go somewhere, but a leader will get them to go there. Ronald Reagan's greatest one here. Greatest leaders are not the ones who do the greatest things, but they're ones that get the people to do the greatest things. People laughed at the United States in reference to having Ronald Reagan, an actor, being the president of the United States, of the greatest country in the world. Yet, he wasn't the one that did it, but he got a lot of people to do great things underneath his command leadership. Other ones. This one is Bridget Hyacinth. Bridget wrote a book called The Future of Leadership. This is where I say, please take notes on this, because this book is one of those from the 21st century, which is great. Bridget has written four, three other books, but The Future of Leadership is a great book for anyone that's thinking about trying to get into a leadership role or need to be able to get into there. Leaders don't create more followers, they create more leaders. Bridget is a person I follow now, and her book is wonderful. Please pick it up and read about it. John Maxwell, an individual that has spoken many, many times, author of at least 77 books. That's the last time I saw. People don't do what people hear, they do what they see. 
Maxwell has been uh, presenting for a number of years. He wrote a book called The 21, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, another fantastic one. He has uh, 21 different laws in there, the law of respect, the law of solid ground, the law of addition. And one of the comments he makes is that law of solid ground, trust is the foundation of leadership. And I, I think about this many times when I'm doing something, you want to make sure your individuals that work with you or work underneath you or work with, uh, side by uh, side by side with you, they can trust you all the time. Other quotes. Oh, yeah, there's one for me. If you aren't reading about leadership, you're falling behind. One of the things I enjoy doing is reading about leadership. I'm going to base this presentation a lot on something called West Point Leadership Lessons, and I'm going to talk about Scott Snare. But there's also one I'm reading right now, and it's called Dare to Lead by a lady named Brene Brown. Brene, ba Brene Brown is a social worker who has written four books about leadership. And you think, where did she come from that the, uh, a social worker is reading about, writing about leadership? Wonderful book there, too. Please pick one up. And then the last Finnish uh, biography I read was in reference to Grant. Ron Chernow wrote about Grant, and there are things in there about his leadership, not only during the Civil War, but also being his, during his presidency, of uh, being fantastic. It is a wonderful, long book. It took me about nine months to read it because of different times I was reading it, but it's about 900 pages long. Yeah, the great uh, story in reference to leadership in different times, especially in the 1880s and 1860s, 1870s, all the way through to his death. So what I'm going to talk about now is West Point leadership lessons, and I thank Scott Snare, who is a class of 1988, who was the class president of his class. And when you're president of a class, you don't just stop being president. You're president for the rest of your years that you're alive. Scott, I, put, I took snippets out of his book because I really believe that a lot of his comments, uh, not only from uh, similar to John Maxwell, but Scott's are all in reference to West Point leadership lessons. So let me bring up some of those for him. Seek responsibility and take responsibility for your actions. In the military, they always tell you never volunteer for anything. But I look at this one and say, seek responsibility. Look for the positions where you can get something done. Take responsibility for the actions. I have had told my boss, uh, my managers over the past, yes, I screwed up. Sorry, it won't happen again, sir. I took responsibility for some of the actions I did, and they weren't always perfect. But I also look at it and say, seek responsibility. Look for those things that you can do. I don't care if it happens to be your boss saying, hey, find a, find a venue for a lunch for our, our team. We want to go out and grab it. I'll take that responsibility. Something simple, but seek responsibility for anything you can do. I wrote this down, and Scott didn't put this down, but I did. Do you think you know yourself? Go to Ranger School. Ranger School was a course, eight weeks and two days, and probably four hours and five minutes and 32 seconds, if I think about back to it, was a time where it challenged me not only physically, mentally, socially, spiritually, psychologically. Three phases. The first phase, no problem. A couple weeks, three weeks long, no problem. Second phase got more challenging. The third phase was when I saw myself and said, hey, I need to improve. There was a lot I had to learn. I say to people who go to ranger school, very few can go to ranger school, but if there's something out there that you want to find something, challenge yourself to do something that's way out of the ordinary. Push yourself to do something. We'll continue on with a lot of more snippets from Scott. Great leaders believe it's their duty to take your organizations outside its comfort zone. I think of the great leaders I've worked with and thinking about where they make a Make objective for this year, the objective 2004, objective 2005. This is what we need to bring the company to. This is what we need to bring our group to. This is what we need to bring our area to. And when you start with it, you don't have an objectives listed. You just list this is what needs to be done. And I know I've said it many times. We can do it. I have no idea how we're going to do it, but we'll get it done. And you push that. So as a leader, you push yourself in order to be able to get others to do things like this. Get out of your comfort zone. Don't believe the peer pressure ended or bullying ended in high school. 
Scott talks about it, that it's no matter where you are, where you are in life, bullying and peer pressure continue on. It's not only in grade school, not only in high school, it's in college because they're looking at it, peer pressure saying, why are you doing that, Chuck? Why, why are you pushing yourself so much? And, and you look at other leaders, there's always times when a leader will be told by the naysayers, you can't do this. But you look at that and believe that peer pressure continues. But I look at it right now, and bullying continues in Congress as well. If you're a Democrat, you better vote the Democratic line. If you're on a Republican, you better vote, vote the Republican line. And you think about it, this is actually bullying as well. We want bullying to stop in grade school. We want it to stop in high school. We stop, want it to stop in college. It continues. Ladies and gentlemen, it is continual. And it, where do we learn it from? We learn it from the people that are leading us. We need to look at that and say, how does bullying stop? How do we get to the people to say, if you need to vote a specific way in a, a, something in Congress, vote the way you believe it, not the way that everybody wants you to. Bullying continues on way past high school. I think of this many times when the quote at West Point is a uh, cadet does not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate anybody who does. Being less than truthful is addictive. Think about a time when you may hear, talk to a manager and a manager will say, well, we're not really sure whether we're going to get salary increases next year or not, or whether we're going to get bonuses. And he or she may already know that they're not going to get bonuses or salary increase. But the next question comes up right after that. And not being totally truthful becomes difficult because you continue on. It's addictive. It's one of those things where you realize that, well, I didn't tell the truth this time. Well, if I didn't tell the truth the second time, and it continues on. Being less than truthful is addictive, and your subordinates will see that. A couple more times. No people's names. I have enjoyed this part a lot when I saw it in the book and I, I smiled because this is one of the things I, I push myself. I want to make sure I know individuals' names. The cleaners, security contractors, rental car company reps, anybody I know, I, I like to be able to use their name because it's the most important word that a person will hear every day. Hello, Chuck, how you doing? And if a president of a company says that to me, I smile. I, I do the same thing with the cleaners that we have here, or the security people. When I'm leaving at night, I say goodnight to the security individuals and know them by name. Contractors we may have on site, I talk to them to make sure that they realize that I care about them. Even though they don't report to me, eh, there's no way that they would be ever in my area of responsibility, but I think it's important for them to know that. And it's important, it's the most important word that a person will hear any day. So if I say, thank you, Scott, or thank you, Bill, or thank you, Michael, the, you know people's names as you pass them in the, in the hall. I've heard it many times. Oh, I can't. I don't remember people's names well. If you don't, learn them. Learn a process of somehow affiliating a name with a face and be able to remember it. Yeah, that once in a while time, we're all we're walking around the corner and I'll be thinking of Pete. And all of a sudden, I'll see a gentleman named Philip and say, hi, Pete. And say, oh, I'm sorry, Philip. Because it happens to us all where we, we change, we, we forget about the person's name. But if you can keep them, please know people and give, call them by their first name. Carl Rogers came up with a, a comment. It says, client-centered therapy. Mirror what you have heard. When somebody's talking to you, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you can be able to repeat, repeat back to them what you hear. It's not always something where you're always trying to think of the next thing. Think and be quiet. Listen to individuals when they talk to you and mirror what they heard. So if somebody says, I think I heard you say this, do it back with them and let and listen to, and be quiet and listen to what individuals are saying to you. This is a great char characteristics of a leader. This came out in actually, of all things, the 21st century. You talk about transformational versus transactional leadership. James McGregor Burns talks about this. Transformational leader. Inspire others to do extraordinary things. You think about those individuals that are out there that have inspired others. But then you also have transactional leaders, compliance by withholding rewards. I'll give you a bonus if you do this. I'll give you a piece of candy if you do this versus transformational. Inspire others to do extraordinary things. And the reason being is transformational, as it says before, 
you need to be charismatic or a caring leader. And then people will go out of their way to please their manager. And you think about that if people are caring, there are individuals that will go out of the way to help please their manager. And as a leader, celebrate change. <laughs> a lot of people will say, gosh, there's only one constant is change. But if you think about it, leaders will push and try to have people uh, celebrate some change. Say something positive about it to be working well. Okay. One of the things I've thought about many times is leaving your ego at the door. Obviously, my title is not manager, it's not director, it's not vice president, it's not president of a company. And I think that it's important to be able to leave an ego at the door or a pompous personality when you're talking to individuals. Come on down to that level that they are. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I just want to make sure that people are seeing that you need to be able to do this and be one-on-one -on -one with an individual and try to stay behind, sitting behind that big desk. Make a difference in life. And I'll talk about this a little bit with three days till Monday with the book I wrote. But make a difference in every day that you're here. Try to be able to help out others. Try to, what, what can I do to help you out? Instead of always receiving, try to give out. Making a difference by volunteering. One of the things I volunteer with was something I call PFEW, and we'll talk about Pennsylvania Free Enterprise Week later. But I wrote a book called Three Days to Monday. And the book is all based upon positive thoughts. A lot of times, have you heard people say, thank God it's Friday? And I would turn around and say to them, hey, but there's only three days to Monday. And people would call me crazy by doing this because they say, Chuck, wait a minute, why do you do this? I said, because why would you hate one-seventh of your life? Every Monday should be celebrated that you have an opportunity. Work is actually something positive that you have, that you've, done for your entire life because of you're getting rewarded for working. I, I, the book explains it a little bit more than what I'll do, go into right now, but Monday should be the best day of the week. And when I say that to people, and I'll say it in French and I'll say it in Spanish, Monday is the best day of the week and you have to think of that positively, making a difference with individual's life. They walk in Monday morning, sure, there are days when I walk in on Monday and I am tired because I'm traveling, but I still think about Monday as saying, make Monday a positive day because if you do that in your mind, others can see that in you. And if you're a leader, you want to make sure that Monday is a good day for you because you want to have people starting off on a good day. Okay. We talked about Pennsylvania Free Enterprise Week, and I think Scott will talk about this later on, and I have a video we can show. But PFEW is what they call a seven-day wonder, wonder, and it's for high school juniors and seniors and go into a week business course. Now you hear about people going to a football camp for a week, basketball camp for a week, baseball camp for a week, and they do nothing but doing basketball camp. Pennsylvania Free Enterprise is a business camp. And this past year, we had 3,200 applicants, juniors and seniors in high school, for 2,200 slots. If you think about it, it's a little bit more than 60% acceptance rate into a high school program where they're paying for it, as well as learning about business. They learn a lot more about, more, much more than business during this time, but they also learn about leadership. They elect their own CEOs. They elect their own chief financial officers. They elect their own head of manufacturing and marketing and sales. And these individuals, 18 students in a company, work in order to be able to learn about life. And I'm talking about juniors to seniors. So we're talking about maybe 14 to 17 year old students coming together, living on a high school, on a college campus for a week and learning a lot about themselves as well as their peers. I've been doing this PFEW and I just finished up my 21st year. I go for one week during a year. South Carolina has something called South Carolina Business Week, which of all things is going on this week. But it's the same thing where they're bringing out juniors and seniors from the entire state, bringing them all together and talking about business programs. It's a wonderful organization. If we have time at the end, I think Scott's going to show a, a video on it. But this uh, brings me to the end. And what I want to say is thank you to the director of admissions who gave me a lot of the slides for uh, from West Point. 
especially the ones uh, that look like they're from the 1950s and 1940s and non-color slides. And it says the emissions, the course starts here. Scott, all yours. Thank you, Chuck, really appreciate it. Um, so I really admire practical presentations, and, and Chuck, you've delivered just on that on one, of my, on one of my favorite topics of leadership here today. So to our audience, uh, we're going to take the next 10, 15 minutes or so, and we're going to pose questions to Chuck. You're going to be able to pick his brain on, on your leadership questions, or if you've got some leadership observations, we'd welcome those comments as well. Um, so use the chat toolbar, pose those to me, and then I'll pose the questions and observations to Chuck. Um, with that said, I do want to recognize one individual on the front end here. I want to give a, a big high five to uh, Janine, who pointed out, who gave us some great feedback um, about uh, part of our programming at Supply Chain Now Radio. Our, t our team is looking in on that now, and um, Janine, really appreciate you uh, passing that along and, and helping us uh, get better. So thank you to that. Um, all right, to our audience, the, the line is open now. Send your questions and observations via the chat toolbar. Um, Chuck, first question comes from Amanda, of all people. <laughs> and Amanda asks, uh, what prompted you to write the book, Three Days Till Monday? Is Amanda your wife? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Back in 2008, 2004, I, I go up to this Pennsylvania Free Enterprise, and I'm what they call a company advisor up there. A CA guides the company of between 15 and 18 high school students in, in running this program for the week. And I am not the CEO, I'm not the CFO, I am the advisor for this company. And I had some free time at the end of the week, and I started bringing up different topics. And I thought, gosh, if I have an hour, let me just talk to you about different things. I've taught in high school religious education programs as well as other high school programs. And so I, I threw out maybe about 15 topics, talked about them for about an hour and finished up. And the class said, almost in whole, said, you need to write a book. And I kind of laughed it off and said, yeah, sure, I, I, I don't need to write a book. And that's back in 2006. 2007, I gave the same class, obviously, to another set of students, 2008, 2009, and it continued on. Well, in 2006, I had this one lady named Hannah, and Hannah wrote me, emailed me, about every six months, and said, Chuck, what's the status of your book? I haven't heard anything about your book, Chuck. What's going on? And so I would call a partial harassment from an individual as a high school student thinking, <laughs> I need to put this in writing. I spread it out, put it into 22 different chapters on different things, and then published it. I found out how to publish it because of a high school student that was a PFEW that says, Chuck, you can self-publish through createspace.com. I said, what's that? He talked to me. Here, we're talking about a junior or senior in high school saying, Chuck, you need to be able to promote this book. This is how you can do it. You can self-publish. Do it this way. And that's what started me off. And there's a few chapters in there that relate specifically to hopefully high school students can relate back to this book after they read it. And maybe three or four years say, what did Chuck talk about this? What did Chuck talk about this? And, and be able to relate back to the book and hopefully make right decisions as they continue on in high school, college, and post-college years. Mm. Appreciate that question, Amanda. And, and really neat book. You know, we Chuck, if you remember, we ordered uh, we've ordered copies of the book numerous times and given them as door prizes to various industry events. And we've gotten some great feedback. Um, so. Uh, check out the book. It's available on Amazon.com, uh, along with, I'm sure, a variety of other places. Um, Chuck, I've got a question for you. So you and I met uh, via the APIX community, the ASCM community. You know, you've been a, um, a great leader as part of the upstate South Carolina chapter, the Industrial Crescent chapter. Um, what value have you found in participating in, in the APIX community, which, of course, is now part of the broader ASCM community? Good question, Scott. What's interesting is that I was made the supply chain manager for our truck facility in Spartanburg, South Carolina, so Michelin's truck facility. We have two facilities in North America, one's up in Nova Scotia, the other one's here in Spartanburg, and I became the supply chain manager there. Put in there, all my background in supply chain before that was logistics and running distribution centers. And I found out so much more by being a supply chain manager 
yet this was before I got involved with Apex. And when I finished that position, I said, I need to know more about supply chain. I need to understand the depth and what really goes on. I took a pre pretest just to see about you know, 40 questions. How would I do if I just answered questions on supply chain after being a supply chain manager thinking, heck, I can do pretty good with this. I know my, I know my backgrounds. I can do different things. I took the test and when I got 25 out of, or I, I got, I'm sorry, a 25% right. I realized that if I had done A, B, C, D all by itself and just put D all the time, I would have gotten it. And I realized that I need to go back and get more certifications, understand a lot more to CS uh, uh, supply chain. Looked up uh, Apex, saw they had certifications in CSCP and CPIM at the time, and took the CSCP test course and passed it and realized, oh gosh, there was so much more out there. CLTD has come on logistics, transportation, distribution. And as much as I thought I knew, I learned 10 times more. And for anybody that is in supply chain or thinking about being a supply chain, my recommendation is get involved with Apex. It's not only good for certifications, but also the camaraderie of other individuals that you can work with and find out what their expertise is and help out. I'm currently an instructor, just finished up the first year of doing that in, in May. And as an instructor, you even learn more. And for anybody that sits there and thinks that you can't learn more about supply chain, need to really look at it and, and think about uh, different areas you can continue to learn. If you took supply chain as a major in college, go back into Apex and learn even more. Fantastic. And, and incidentally, uh, we are hosting Paul Bolstorff uh, with ASCM. Uh, on our podcast tomorrow as he's going to be talking about um, their new enterprise certification offering, uh, as well as other offerings that the ever-growing ASCM community is um, is rolling out to the marketplace. So we look forward to that podcast. And Chuck, you know, as a, as a fellow APIC slash ASCM member, I appreciate all that you do. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you, you don't, uh, you had mentioned some of the other things you do, such as uh, the uh, Supply Chain 101 Lemonade Game, where you know, you've been part of our, our efforts to take volunteers of supply chain folks into schools to talk supply chain with third, fourth, and fifth graders. That is incredibly rewarding, and it helps us you know, tackle that awareness gap that, that uh, all, it is all too great these days. But, it, but the good news is it's getting better. Um, yeah, right, and after so, I retire and you retire, Scott, we need to have those individuals of third, fourth, and fifth grade come in and be able to take our positions. They need to know about supply chain operations. That's right. That is right. All right, so this next question is a great question, and I'm going to withhold the name of the asker, just, just be on the safe side. Um, so she asked, what advice would you give, Chuck, to someone that currently reports to a transactional leader? Ooh, versus transformational. Mm. We all learn leadership skills. We learn from the best and we learn from the worst. And have I had managers that I would look at and say, we're not the best managers? Yes. But I would learn for things I didn't want to do and said I need to do this. The best way is to learn from that and realize that if I become or when I become a manager, what can I learn from that individual and what things would I not want to do? It's, it's difficult to be able to have a, a transactional manager when he or she may be that type of style. That's their style. And it's not one of these things you're going to be able to change easily. Yeah. What a great question. And, and Chuck, a, a tough question. I appreciate you weighing in on that. Um, ever, you know, I, I've certainly reported to a wide variety of different types of leaders and I wish all of them were transformational, uh, transformational throughout my career. But I think all of us are given our dose of those transactional leaders that we can still learn from, uh, including some of the things what not to do as a leader, but uh, you, know, you got to play with the, uh, the card, the, the hand you've been dealt. Um, all right. So the next question comes from Nicole, uh, Chuck. And Nicole asks, what tips do you have for leaders on how to best adapt to the changing workforce, i.e. millennials versus baby boomers, et cetera? Good question. I like that. One of the things I have continued to do, and you saw with some of the books I brought up is continue to read about leadership. 
as I was talking about before, Brene Brown wrote a book, and it's her fourth book on Dare to Lead. As I said, she's a social worker. Every time I have an opportunity to be able to read another book on leadership, it gives me a different perspective and how to continue to learn. I don't care if you're 20, I don't care if you're 50, I don't care if you're 69, or 70, or 80, you always can continue to learn. I liked what Brene Brown talks about in here, but you know who, who keyed me into buying this book was my daughter. My daughter, who's 36 years old, and said, Dad, how about if you and I both read this book on Dare to Lead? And I thought, what a great opportunity to have a father-daughter talking about the same book on leadership. And all I can say to others is continue to read books that are on leadership. And if you look at different uh, individuals that have been great leaders, Washington, I've read his book, which was a, a fairly thick, well, as well as what uh, Grant was. Theodore Rex, talk, talking about Teddy Roosevelt a number of years ago, talking about how he handled situations. I, I, I keep on trying to relate back to people in the past that have been great leaders and reading about them. And they're not always perfect, but you can learn leadership skills from all these individuals. And I, I, I continue like I continue to read books on leadership and hopefully can pass that on to individuals. Mm. And what was your quote? If you're not reading about leadership best practices and you're falling behind, right? You're falling behind. That's correct. <laughs> All right, a quick programming note to our audience. We've got a couple more questions to take, um, but as Chuck mentioned, we are, after we conclude today's webinar, right here on this channel. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere. If you're interested in learning more about the PFEW, where Chuck's been volunteering for 21 years, uh, the Pennsylvania Free Enterprise Week, stay tuned. We're going to wrap up the interview, or, or the, uh, the the webinar today, and then we'll play that that video right here. Okay, next question comes from Mr. Paul Bohr, uh, and, and you know we're big believers at Supply Chain Radio. When we talk about leadership, we, we like to offer um, resources where you can improve your leadership, and we're going to feature Paul Bohr in, in a few minutes here talking about some of the offerings that um, he and his team are collaborating with Apex Atlanta to, to offer the market. But before we get there, Chuck, Paul asks, how has the Army adapted leadership to 21st century needs? Great question. Cool. <laughs> One of my classmates is a gentleman named Bob Caslin, three-star general, ran West Point for five years, and has now, as of this past Friday, been asked to be the president of the University of South Carolina. Bob is a great leader, and the Army is continuing to change. I always think of the Army as being the forward thinker of leadership and how they're changing. If you think about the old days, uh, gosh, you know, back in the 40s and 50s when we were getting ready for wars, it was either do as I say or else get out of the Army, and they obviously did. I look at what we're doing now, and as I talked about in this as well as what John, uh, John Maxwell talks about, uh, trust is a foundation for leadership. And people are looking at what you do, not what you say. And I firmly believe that the leaders in the military now are showing and saying, watch me, I'm going to be leading you. But it's not just by word, but it's also by action. And I think we have continued to lead that way for many years now. Yeah, the, the military is not uh, immune to the ever-evolving workforce and leadership uh, environment, is it, Chuck? Not at all. Not at all. We're That's out right. there all the time. Mm. All right. Paul, great question, and we look forward to hearing from you in just a minute. So we're going to take one more question, and this question comes from our friend Dawn, uh, also a member of the board up there at the Apex Industrial Crescent. Hope you're doing well, Dawn. Uh, Chuck, Dawn asks, what suggestions would you have for the parents of third, fourth, and fifth graders to help transform their kids into tomorrow's leaders? What a great question. Let me think of how many years ago I had to do that. <laughs> I have to come back to the same thought as what Scott Snare said is people are looking at leaders. People are looking at their parents. And I don't care whether you're third, fourth, or fifth grade, there's leaders in there. A third grader can be leading his or her kindergarten. And, and all you want to do is have the children hopefully imitate 
but they see what their parents are doing. And if their parents are good leaders, they continue. If it's a one parent uh, family, instead of having the two parents there, the, the parents have to be able to say is, I am a leader of my, of my family. The high, the high school students, the grade school students have to realize that yes, they are leaders too. As I teach these high school students, you know, going to 11th and 12th grades, I said, you are leaders now, let alone in 10 years, you're gonna be leading this country. But it needs to be, look, everybody looks at it and said, you need to be a leader. Every individual needs to be a leader. Absolutely, uh, and, and, and I would argue that leadership today in this environment is more important than ever before, especially successful leadership. I wasn't around in the, in the, during the times of the American Revolution, the other <laughs> historical times, but man, we sure do need effective, successful, progressive, collaborative leadership, transformational leadership today. And Chuck, I appreciate your perspectives that I think our audience will really enjoy and, and be able to act on. Okay. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Uh, so that concludes our Q&A session. Big thanks. To a bunch of great questions there. Hopefully, um, uh, and, and we couldn't get to a couple, but really appreciate y'all participating. Uh, and Chuck, again, thanks for your time perspective. So we're going to wrap up our session this afternoon on a few special items. So, so the first one, we want to recognize uh, Paul Bohr, Chief Transformation Architect, Consultant, uh, with who's had significant senior leadership experience. So um, one of our sponsors, Apex Atlanta, is collaborating with Paul and his firm on a couple of offer, uh, offerings right here in the metro Atlanta area. So, Paul, I'm going to unmute you here momentarily and invite you to share more information with us. All right. Well, I, I think the best place to start this discussion is the point that Chuck made earlier, the difference between transactional leadership versus transformation leadership. And let me do a sound check here. Can you hear me all right, Scott? Yes, sir. You're coming in loud and clear, Paul. All right. Well, uh, just to highlight that difference, because I've chosen to spend a lot of time on the transformation leadership side. And the way we define that, transformational leadership is delivering significant change in a very accelerated time frame. Now, uh, to do that, leaders are not just one-on-one -on -one and effective face-to-face -face with folks. They're engaging entire organizations successfully. They're providing those bigger perspectives that has not only individuals, but teams trying to understand how to look at something and how to address the issues. Also, developing enterprise capabilities. A lot of processes across many organizations and the ability to align them and get them to see the world the same way and drive on the same priorities is a critical part of that transformation leadership. And then finally, something that is very near and dear, I think, to Chuck's heart, which is the behavioral examples. You want to drive high performance behaviors. That's not something you talk forward. That's something you have to demonstrate and show people and live that way for it to take root. Now, for what we're working with uh, Apex Atlanta this summer, you see the three courses here. Uh, they actually represent a 21st century transformation. I've been in adult learning. I am a SCORE master instructor with ASCM. I've also been a master instructor with Motorola University and work with Michigan State University in uh, executive development. But one of the main takeaways that I've had to adapt to in the last five years as we go into the 21st century and adapt to, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about millennials and whatever they're calling the next generation, but the expectations for learning and leadership have changed significantly. Uh, if you look at just cycle times of products or life cycles of products and even enterprises, they've so greatly accelerated the, the change is constant and people are just overwhelmed and bombarded. And sometimes the first task is simply sorting out what's important in all of this without being able yet to take on what should be done about it. Likewise, the questions are a bigger magnitude when you're talking transformation. We're talking about end-to-end -end supply chains that may have thousands upon thousands of business entities and organizations, all with their own priorities, their focus 
and their own reasons or even culture for doing things. And then you add to that the increased risk. Uh, just look at all the tariffs. It doesn't take a very big supply chain these days to, to run into a lot of complexity internationally with the tariffs, the risks in terms of trying to get things delivered. All of those things have just gotten bigger in question and more complex. So what you see in these three courses, the first course is an online course. And most leaders these days don't like to set through lecture. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, you need to feed them that information in a very succinct way and give them a foundation in the language and the concepts. And that's what that first online course does. Uh, you transition from that to a framework like SCORE. And for those that haven't had a SCORE course yet, SCORE is a framework. And it gives you a way to greatly accelerate performance improvement efforts by giving you the broader perspective and attributes to performance, metrics, linked to processes and processes to individual activities, practice metrics and skills. You can line up and build capabilities very succinctly in an organization under a set of priorities. And then finally, the architect, which is a simulation course. The last piece in adult learning these days is really that applied learning and, and to earn an architect certification, you're actually certified that you have done and are capable of delivering transformational leadership, which is this whole other ball game. It is done through simulation because we put teams of executives together to create and deliver playbook deliverables that move. They provide the perspectives, the events and collaborative workshops, uh, architects even facilitating those workshops and then delivering capabilities to the organization that are sustained. And those are the high level requirements for being an architect. So we've had to adapt this, this very high level leadership program to the kind of learning that people expect and to the time they have available in the 21st century. And uh, Scott, I'm gonna stop there for a second. And uh, do you, would you like to take questions on all of this? I'd love to, but for the sake of time, we're going to uh, move right ahead. But Paul, for folks that are interested in learning more, not only can they go to cscta.net, but how would they get in touch with you? Right. Uh, you can get in contact with me at my email. It's just simply Paul Bohr, P A U L B O H R, at execution, E X E C Q T I O N dot com. Perfect. Thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate you joining us. And again, uh, we appreciate Apex Atlanta sponsorship. This is a unique offering that uh, Apex Atlanta, the chapter, has developed with Paul and, and the execution team. And, and we'd encourage you to check it out and see if it's right for you and your organization. Thanks, Paul. All right. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along uh, to our audience, we want to invite you to join us at Modex 2020 in Atlanta in March. Uh, we're we're going to be broadcasting live. You can learn more about the one of the largest trade shows in the supply chain industry here in the U.S. at modexshow.com. On that note, you can find our Supply Chain Now radio team on the road at a variety of trade shows and industry conferences. Uh, you can check us out at Supply Chain Now Radio. I think we've got a couple of those on that next slide there. Um, from South Carolina to Austin, Texas to Las Vegas, Nevada, we'd, we'd love to have you all uh, connect with us in person and uh, learn more. Um, in terms of next steps, if there's anything we can do to serve as a resource for you, you can reach out to us at Scott, S-C-O-T-T, at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. We're happy to, to serve as a resource to you and your organization as best as we can. Okay, so quick programming note. Once again, right after we conclude this webinar momentarily, for those that stay with us, we're going to be sharing uh, a neat informational video on PFEW that Chuck Baker turned us on to. Clearly, something's going on. It's very special to bring leaders like Chuck to um, uh, a, a nonprofit event for 21 years in a row. So stay tuned with us if you're interested in learning more. You won't need to do anything at all. We'll wrap up the interview or we'll wrap up this webinar and then we'll show the video right on this channel. Okay, so as we wrap up today, we want to once again thank Chuck Baker for joining us and sharing his perspective. 
Big special thanks to all of our sponsors here at Supply Chain Radio, Apex Atlanta, Talent Stream, The Effective Syndicate, and Verison. Of course, a big thank you to our audience for your participation. Great questions today. On behalf of Supply Chain Radio, this is Scott Luton concluding today's episode, and we hope to reconnect with you again real soon. Have a great week, everyone.